All right, welcome back to We Play Games. I'm Walker, and here we are in our Vicky 3 Academy about to resume our Advanced Country Guide with Afghanistan today. And today we're going to be doing a sort of a dual thing. We're going to be talking about the new changes to corn laws, but we're also going to be talking about legitimacy. I think that the 1.1 and 1.2 patches largely operates the same in regards to their legitimacy, but I still see people struggling with it. And so we're just going to have a, a brief conversation about that and corn laws as we begin to play Afghanistan here. So one thing that I'm really big on in Victoria 3 is making sure that A, if you're not going to have a lot of migration going on, then you want to work with your devout. Generally speaking, they're going to be a lot more useful to you long term than the landowner. But in this case, we actually started with a jingoist. Uh, starting with a jingoist is, you know, like one of those yawn sort of things after you've seen it 10,000 times, but it is pretty good for us here because we're trying to reduce the power of the landowner, and starting with a jingoist means we can immediately start working on professional army, assuming, of course, that you do start with the mandatory drill technology. Not everybody does. And in this case, because the size of our economy is so small, I'm actually going to hold on to this excess authority. I could plow it into a new consumption tax, but we're just not getting a lot of, like, actual pounds per authority point. And I don't necessarily care that much about bolstering or suppressing anybody else, because we're going to be using the landowners via corn laws in a relatively short period of time. Ah, good, we hit professional army. So now we can go ahead and start utilizing corn laws. So one thing that's different about corn laws in 1.2 is they dramatically changed the shakeup in regards to the way the market liberal works, which we'll talk about when we find our market liberal. But I, I wanted to go ahead and use the jingoist here, not only to get a little bit of bonus approval with the, the landowner, but I think that just generally speaking, professional army is better than peasant levies. And so I was happy to, to get that passed. Ah, it looks like the uh, the AI has decided to have a, an East India Sikh Empire fight, but they're still fighting for relatively little. That's something that's probably a, a 1.2 problem. All right, so we have a new leader for our age. All right, so now we have our market liberal. This is the reason that Corn Laws is good, of course, is that this character is going to have some very specific personal ideologies that are going to overwrite the natural ideology of the landowner. In this case, this means that now the landowner is going to use this massive 54% clout to give us a lot of legitimacy, but also be in favor of changing into laissez-faire, also being in favor of changing into interventionism, if you want to just take it one step. But they're also in favor of switching into free trade, and now they're in favor of serfdom abolished. So this is a really big change in terms of what uh, the market liberal does. Being in, in favor of serfdom abolished means that you no longer have to play that interesting dance at the beginning of the game to try to get serfdom out of the way before you can enable corn laws. But keep in mind that the easiest way to do that was either A, fight an easily manipulatable civil war, which didn't feel great, or B, rely on just pure RNG, right? Prior to this change here in 1.2, your best way to make use of corn laws as a country that started with serfdom was just bring the rural folk into government to serve alongside the landowner, click serfdom abolished, and then you might get it. Um, and if you do, great. And if you don't, no skin off your back. But like, it was it was definitely the right thing to do most of the time um, in a way that I th think wasn't even particularly flavorful. So I, th I think that the way that they've changed it up here, I, th I think is actually healthy. It does though mean that corn laws are even stronger than they once were. So you do need to take that into account. So now we can build a relatively low legitimacy government, um, but this would cause a massive penalty to our enactment time in exchange for a small bonus to our enactment success chance. That's not worth it, because this is minus 25% enactment time and this is plus 50% enactment time. We should just roll with a 54% chance on, on serfdom abolished. But this does have some cascading effects for anybody who's going to be playing around with the landowners for a meaningful amount of time, because it means that now you're going to have a much easier time cutting their power down, but also you're going to have a really easy time getting an insanely high approval with them. Um, and so if you have any generals who you think are like generally going to be problems for you, you can fire them. That's okay. The only downside, of course, is that if you have a really high landowner, you have a lot of clout there, and therefore you're going to be finding a lot of landowners here. So you can see here that the private construction is actually queuing up a logging camps for us, which is really helpful in terms of our economic development here. 
All right, looks like the Sikh Empire got crushed by the East India Company. And they've declared us a rival. Well, we may have to do something about that. They do have an arms industry that we could potentially use. All right, so we got serfdom abolished. As we gradually cut down the power of the landowner, that is going to reduce the legitimacy of our government. But for now, I think I'm going to be satisfied with going into laissez-faire. So the reason that I'm excited to be moving into laissez-faire isn't necessarily because we're a big industrial economy yet, but because of the way it will enable our drift into a big industrial economy. It's also going to make it so that loan interest rate goes down. Um, it's going to give us way more money once we have enough capitalists. But you, you note that it is disallowed by serfdom. And so this change to corn laws is actually a really big deal. Um, it's going to dramatically open up availability of laissez-faire to people. So now that we've, we've done this, we could potentially end corn laws immediately. But I like holding on to corn laws because of the way that it ends. So the end of the corn laws event chain um, is 10% of your laborers become more loyalists. And so if you conquer some territory first, generate some radicals there, and then end your corn laws, you're kind of getting double work out of the event. But if you want to just end it right away, you can. All right, so we've hit laissez-faire. All right, so now that we've hit laissez-faire, there is one more thing that we potentially could use the corn laws to move into, which is free trade. Now, free trade is very powerful, but it does demand some very specific inputs. One amongst them is ports. As Afghanistan, um, until we conquer some territory out here uh, and actually have access to the sea, free trade doesn't really do anything for us, so I'm not super worried about utilizing free trade. We're going to push into it after academia. If we lose our landowner, who is a market liberal, then we'll lose the ability to utilize this clout in order to pass the law. Um, but this one, I think, is a little less important for Afghanistan in particular. Generally speaking, though, free trade is very powerful for any country that starts with a lot of peasants because of the way it's going to allow you to employ pops. It's going to let you employ pops in your trade centers. And trade centers, as countries that actually have access to, you know, trade can actually become very powerful. They can generate a lot of jobs. But right now there's like basically none because there's not a lot of trade going on in Afghanistan. Uh, but that's one of those things that really is sculptable by the society that you're building. But I think that generally speaking, people overestimate the impact of tariffs on your economy. It's generally not that useful, whereas free trade is going to give you way more supply or demand for whatever good you're looking at. Um, but it's also going to reduce trade route bureaucracy costs to the point where it really isn't very expensive to just set up trade routes that are going to generate value for you. Now, in regards to legitimacy, there is a really important thing that's going on here in legitimacy in 1.1 and 1.2. So legitimacy isn't just being derived from the clout of the interest groups in your government um, or your taxes or the way your head of state is in there. It's also drawing on this government ideology penalty and size of government. And those are both going to be derived from your laws. And it's one of the things that makes oligarchy so very powerful right now is this actually has a minus 10% government ideology penalty. And what that means is, unlike all of these forms of democracy down here, except for universal suffrage, it's going to be relatively easy for you to have high legitimacy as an oligarchy. Because as an oligarchy, if you want to have high legitimacy, all you really need to do is put some parties together here that have a lot of clout, and then you'll be fine 99% of the time. It's better if you happen to have a way to fit your head of state into government. Um, but one way, of course, that you can do that is by switching out of a monarchy and into a theocracy or a republic. And that's where you want to keep a very special eye out for the ideologies of the leaders of the interest groups in question and for the ideologies of the generals that you potentially have access to. In this case, we have a jingoist and two moderates. And a jingoist is actually a lot more useful than moderates in terms of generating advantage in the early game. We already used the main advantage of a, a jingoist, and so none of those characters offer us anything particularly interesting. But if we had access to admirals, we might find a landowner that was a, a theocrat, or a member of the ulema who is a theocrat. And that would be really strong, because that would allow us to potentially switch out of a monarchy. But generally speaking, if you want to be building a high legitimacy government as a democracy, at least in 1.2, 
with the way it currently works, I think you kind of need to be parliamentary republic and universal suffrage, because anything that comes with a government ideology penalty attached to it is going to really brutalize you whenever it comes to the formation of your parties, especially if you aren't careful at the way that you curate the characters who are powerful and important in your country. But the other important thing here is that now we've, we've switched over to laissez-faire as our private construction law. And so what I think that's going to do is it's going to dramatically shape where our investment pool is coming from as we industrialize. All right, so now we can potentially build this coalition, which is going to be a really conservative, old school, rural coalition. But it's going to give us a small chance to work on slavery band, which is generally speaking going to be useful. So I'm going to be in favor of it. Now, this is going to cause a significant drop with our landowner approval, but it doesn't matter, right? We... We've built their happiness up so high through the, the utilization of corn laws that now we can work on things that make them weak without making them happy. And there's that other advantage to having corn laws is that we just got something that increases minimum wage. And increasing your minimum wage can be pretty useful as a, a small country like this because it's going to increase our standard of living for people. And it's going to increase the standard of living in a way that's economically productive for the country. Ah, look at that. We actually rolled a theocrat in control of our lemma, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can flip in right away. All right, there we got slavery banned. And so that's one of the, the other things that you can get out of corn laws is you can just get just enough happiness out of your landowner that you can do some really important law work. And another thing we're doing here is Afghanistan because our economy is so small, we actually are switching back and forth between our production methods on our construction sectors. So we're gonna let uh, an input good shortage build up on the iron frame buildings, then we switch over to wood, we burn off the input good shortage, and then we switch back to iron. And as it turns out, that's, that's really efficient if you're just trying to get construction done and you don't care that much about money. And as Afghanistan, we actually started out with a large enough economy that I I'm not really afraid about burning cash. And that is what this does. It does burn cash. And now, of course, we can switch our tooling workshops over to wrought iron tools which is going to increase our, our productivity here in regards to making capitalists, because we need it to be on privately owned. But that's going to help cheapen tools to work in our iron mines, and in turn increase demand for tools. So it's all around going to be pretty productive for us. And of course, because we've dipped into laissez-faire, our debt is a lot less expensive, and so I'm okay generating a little bit of it. If we need to trim back one level of construction sector here just to balance the books, we can. Excellent. So we've also picked up a uh, stock exchange, which means now we can actually work on free trade. Now, you, again, you don't necessarily need to go into free trade. Um, you could potentially shift into protectionism instead. But I think that generally speaking, it's way more powerful to be in free trade in terms of just utilizing your bureaucracy in a way that's going to make your economy stronger. And so that's going to be it for the uh, the Corn Laws and Legitimacy Rework episode. We're going to switch into a more legitimate government here. But when we, when we switch into a democracy or a theocracy here as Afghanistan, probably a democracy, just so that we can show off the way to form a republic that has good parties that you can work with. We'll talk about legitimacy again. But I think in the meantime... It should be pretty easy for you to understand how to build a legitimate government here in Victoria 3. We can't, for instance, re really use the intelligentsia yet. They're just not strong enough. In due time, as we build up our economy, they will become strong enough, but not just yet. But that's, uh, that's Walker, and that's our Corn Laws rework for Open Beta 1.2 in our Advanced Country Guide series with Afghanistan. Take care.